This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Lily Ong. In 2015, the world faced the largest human migration since World War II due to the outbreak of the Syrian crisis. Today we're seeing something quite similar, not quite as large in magnitude, but comparable in intensity. We have with us here Dr. Tim Mien Thind, President of the Myanmar Association of Hawaii, to talk to us about the Rohingya crisis. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mien. Thank you very much for having me. As you know, Dr. Mian, uh, with any kind of problems and crisis, we have to look back at the history, trace its roots in order to more effectively address it. So why don't we take a look back at the history um, of you know, the Rakhine State and see what um, might have contributed to the crisis today? If you look back at history, we are going back many, many years because Way back, uh, even during the British times, uh, Burma was administered under India, and India included both East and West Pakistan. And what we have is a situation where most of the people from the East Pakistan were migrating into Myanmar at that time. And the British, of course, used the uh, conquer and divide rule. Uh, the lands belonged to the kings and queens of Burma, which they took away in, in 1885. And therefore, when they became the, gov uh, the government, they owned the land. Now, remember, it's leasehold, not fee simple, just like in Hawaii, where the king uh, owned all the lands. So the British showed to, um, favoritism to those in the East Pakistan area because they wanted them to be faithful to them and loyal to them against the Burmese that, you know, they thought would fight them, which, of course, they did. So from the beginning, during the time of the British, there was infighting between the two. Uh, land were given to the East Bengalis, and then um, the British went on to uh, fight the war and with the Japanese in 1942, when the Japanese advanced, the British tried to protect India, which again, I want to remind everyone, was at that time, uh, East and West Pakistan was together with India. Now, when the British came, uh, when the, I mean, when the time came for the Japanese to attempt to occupy the area, was it true that, you know, um, like most of the nationalist leaders in Southeast Asia, um, General Aung San actually aligned with the Japanese to try to drive out the British in the beginning? Yes, yes, he did. But at that time, uh, later on, he did not uh, go along with the Japanese. It did. I don't know what happened at that time, but that there was a falling out. And the British retreated back, and they armed the Bengalis at that particular point, the northern Rakhine state. And they left thinking that these people would hold the fort, you know, and fight off the Japanese. But instead, those people killed the local native Arakanese people and tried to encamp there. So the grab for land, and one of the ambassadors explained it as expansion uh, through migration, what began even at that time. Mm. So going back to history, a long, long time back, the, the partition of the British Empire of India, East Pakistan, West Pakistan, all of that, when the lines were drawn, um, the Muslims in that area asked that the two districts of Mangdor and Budido was to be uh, included in the East Pakistan. But um, the person who made the decision, Mr. Janan, who was the head of the Muslim community, said that he looked at it and said this uh, area properly belongs to Burma. So he partitioned it that way. And there has always been that particular resentment on the part of the Muslims that that should have been their land. So, you know, it goes back many, many years. It's not just now. Mm -hmm. Now, when General Aung San came into to power, he had the opportunity to 
um, set up a federal state. At least that's what he tried to do, and he got assassinated. Why were the Burmese people so um, against, uh, you know, the set up of a federal system? I don't know if the Burmese were uh, against a federal system. I do know that there was chaos after his assassination. <clears throat> the plans to uh, go towards a federal system were being discussed at that point. But I think that um, there were already a lot of resentment uh, interracially because when the British administered uh, Burma under India, there was a lot of um, migration from India to Burma. And uh, they say that the Rangoon port was second only to New York City in receiving immigrants from India. So the, the layers were the top was the British, and the middle was the Indians, and at the, of course the bottom were the native Burmese. So we had that conflict, and that was more evident than the Federation. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there have been maybe some ceasefires, some truces, some reorganizations, but wars have always gone on in Burma. So is the situation in uh, Rakhine today simply a long tradition of Burmese politics? I think it is a long tradition. Uh, not Burmese politics as much as, uh, like this former ambassador said, was expansion through migration. You have to remember that Bangladesh which was at that time East Pakistan, but now Bangladesh, was, um, or is rather, the size of Georgia, the state in the United States, if you want a comparison. Burma is the size of Texas. And in the Bangladesh side, the population is 165 million. Burma is 65 million. So there is a uh, population expansion problem there. So you will have migration uh, that comes across the border because there is no space. It's one of the most densely populated uh, areas in the world. Mm -hmm. So you have a conflict within there, and people will come over trying to uh, expand. And they did want, at that time of, of the British, when the British left, as well as up to now, those two areas to be part of uh, what they call a protected area so that they could live there. And in some ways, the Burmese look upon it as an expansion of uh, Bangladesh into the Burmese uh, territory, and they see it as an affront to their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. But what about the other parts? I mean, um, Myanmar borders with other countries, North, West, East. Um, there's some, you know, violence to in Kachin, yes. but why is it particularly grave in the Rakhine area? I think that uh, the other areas are not as covered for some reason by the news media, and it is going on. There is no territorial um, encroachment. This one has territorial encroachment. That is one of the main issues here. Plus, you have a lot of press uh, for some reason, and there are allegations of, you know, uh, expenses being given by outside entities, you know, from ISIS to Al Qaeda and so forth, and they are focusing their uh, PR campaign on this particular group. Mm -hmm. Do you not think there are actually international players at play here? Yes, I think so. But, you know, you can't pinpoint it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Myanmar has its resources. I mean, back in the 80s, they discovered a um, gas field just off the coast of Rakhine. So I think there's other international players that's interested in that. Could you maybe name a few of them? Well, the major investors in uh, Myanmar has been China, Thailand, um, those two come to mind. I know there's maybe Indonesia too, but in the Arakan um, coastline, there is um, an economic development uh, entity and uh, or a zone, as they call it, and they hope to uh, extract gas and oil there. 
There's also others on the other side of the coastal, but that's the first one that they're working on. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure China has interest in keeping the area peaceful. Um, Thailand would also want the same thing because they are coming. There, there's a, a road from Bangkok to Burma through uh, Doe area, and there's to be a, a giant port that to be built. So yeah, they have other outside entities who also want to have peace in that area. Mm -hmm. And because uh, Myanmar lacked the technical and financial expertise to, you know, extract the gas, they brought right. in a French conglomerate, Total, mm -hmm. which is the fourth, you know, ranking um, gas company in the world. Um, so last year, um, I heard that um, Total actually extracted 11 million tons of liquefied nitrogen. I'm just wondering where did all the money go? That I don't know. <laughs> it certainly didn't go to the country, although there might have been some. Uh, what I do know, and this is from a labor uh, point of view, is that the people who came to extract and build the infrastructure and so forth brought their own people. They didn't, what I would imagine that in a, a developing country, if you want to help a country um, get, you know, skills and learn to stand on their own two feet, you would want a training component so that people there learn how to extract, learn how, how to do the, um, the, the nitty gritty of, of all the management of, of such an in infrastructure. But they didn't do that. So the Burmese who, were have, who have been in isolation for a long, long time, without much education and without skills, are not being empowered. Hmm. And there was a, a report, um, a confidential one from IMF that came out that showed that um, the gas revenue only contributed to less than 1% of the total revenue. Um, and if, we have to, if they were to actually calculate, it would amount to close to 60% of the revenue. So I think money is coming out, but it's probably not channeled to the right resources. There were, of course, rumors that they are being banked in the offshore accounts of Singapore. <laughs> yeah, it, it's possible, mm -hmm. um, but it, it depends on who's in. Of course, China uh, would have its own banking system uh, in Thailand too. And the years of isolation, again, I go back to that, is because uh, we had no banking system mm -hmm. and everything was cash. So when people come in with lots of money, and they get revenues, they can't really put it in the bank over there because the system really doesn't exist very well. I mean, they don't function very well. Right. It's only been like four or five years where credit cards were introduced. And so uh, I'm not surprised that you know, it would go to a place like Singapore, which is like a financial capital in the uh, Southeast Asian and a, and a safe haven. Too. Yes, a safe yeah. haven, right. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Mia. We're going to take a little short break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about the other role that other international players could play in the Rohingya crisis. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present ThinkTech Hawaii's research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me one o'clock Monday afternoon for ThinkTech Hawaii's research in Manoa. Aloha, my name is Mark Schlav. I'm the host of ThinkTech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Welcome back to the show. Today we have with us Dr. Timian Thind. 
uh, president of the Myanmar Association of Hawaii to talk to us about the Rohingya crisis. Um, Dr. Mia, now going back to the issue of the missing money, mm -hmm. um, do you think that's why sanctions don't really work on Burma because they are somewhat, you know, the Burmese military is somewhat insulated from sanctions? Well, I think sanctions don't work because not everybody's following the sanctions. There are so many who are still working with Burma and, you know, not having anything to some investment is plenty for the country. They can survive. They've worked with China. They've worked with um, Thailand. They've worked with ASEAN. ASEAN is a very big player over there. And so I don't think sanctions work because there are people who are still willing to play, whether or not um, there are sanctions coming from the UN or from the US, particularly the US and, and the British. But I think that um, they're willing to go forward and work with what they have. Mm -hmm. So that's why it doesn't work. I don't think it works. It hurts the, mm -hmm. the, the, the vulnerable and the poor people. Mm -hmm. Do you think the ASEAN players, the ASEAN members, should be adopting a stronger role in this um, human tragedy? Well, yes, they, they should, and they have, they have been. Uh, I think they have advised, they have given guidance, and they're very sympathetic to what's happening. Okay. And going back, talking about China again, um, it's obvious they have a vested interest in peace and harmony in the region since they have a pipeline, mm -hmm. you know, going from the Bay of Bengal all the way to southern China. Um, do you think they might have played a role in perhaps instigating some of the rebels to push back the Burmese military? Oh, I don't think so. Mm. I don't think, I mean, China wants peace and harmony. I don't think China was instigating. There might have been others who were instigating, uh, but not China. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was not, you know, unprovoked. I think August 25th, uh, the attacks on the government post, uh, uh, the, they were police outposts, which, you know, are not as heavily guarded as others. Mm -hmm. And there were so many deaths involved. That brought the backlash from the military to say, you know, there's a major conflict and we have to defend our country. And they came back and did, you know, what military al always does. And that's what led the exodus of all these people leaving the country. Now, when you have, just like what happened in Las Vegas, you have, you know, people sh shooting each other and so forth. People will get out of there, right? Mm -hmm. So there were tons of people leaving the country. And I think that um, the China would not have wanted that kind of uh, backlash from either side. They want to have peace and stability in, the, in that particular region. Mm -hmm. It seems that the fighting has intensified this because there have been new insurgent groups like the Arakan Army. Mm -hmm. um, that group was just about obscure. How did they come so quickly and, you know, aggressively onto the scene? Well, the theory is that they were backed by um, Al-Qaeda, the ISIS, and there's a, uh, a think tank somewhere that's supposedly, you know, thought about how they were going to maneuver this, and they knew exactly what the, the Burmese army would do, because if they attacked the post, they would say there would be a backlash, and with the backlash, there would be an exodus, and then they would have a PR campaign about how terrible the Myanmar people were, or the, you know, the Tamadol was. So it was all well thought out. This is what the theory is, and uh, everybody's been really talking about you know, why doesn't uh, the lady do something? And actually, people don't seem to understand that even though she won the election, she doesn't control. It's just not like the United States where, you know, the president is the commander in chief. That's not the way the con Constitution is written. She does not control the Department of Defense, the Home Ministry, and Border Affairs. The three ministries that are right now in the thick of that the whole area. She doesn't do that. So people are, you know, 
trying to criticize her and throw stones at her and saying, oh, we have to take away her Nobel Peace Prize without really understanding and going into the, the real nitty gritty of why this is happening and mm -hmm. why she is silent. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to take a look at all the things that's happening. You don't know who the players are, the intervening factors. And at that point in time, when you're thinking about what all the solutions might be, silence is golden. Mm. And she needed to be silent, and she was. She thought through, and she's come out with a plan, which I think is uh, accepted by all parties, both international and national. Well, fair enough. She's not the president, but she's regarded as the de facto president. Right. Are, are there other peaceful methods she might have used in negotiating be between the different parties, even though she doesn't have direct control over them? I'm sure that, you know, she has been in touch with them and talked about, you know, what would be the best way to handle the situation. And uh, she did do what she could do, which was the foreign ministry, which is under her. Uh, she did have a diplomatic briefing, and she invited everybody to come and see uh, for themselves what was going on instead of listening to the press. And the press seemed to be so one-sided only talking about the Rohingyas, instead of also talking about the Arakanese and the natives who were also displaced and also went through, you know, horrendous acts of violence. They were uh, victims, too, in many, many ways. But nobody covered that. They only covered one side. And so she invited everybody from the diplomatic court to come in. And I understand the UN also went with them, and they've seen for themselves what has happened. And they've come to uh, say, yes, you know, we see what's happening and we're willing to help you. She asked for help from all the parties to bring peace and stability to that area. And uh, as of yesterday, uh, the foreign ministry and I think um, one of the ministers went to Bangladesh and they came up to uh, an agreement that they would go through um, bringing back the re refugees, so to speak. You don't know who they're refugees from, this side or that side, or mm -hmm. back and forth. And they will go through the whole um, scenario of showing citizenship and allowing those who are, who are truly citizens to come back. So they are considering um, granting citizenship to the Rohingyas or just selected? No, it would. See, Burma has uh, a citizenship law that's not like the United States. In the United States, if you're born, you, are, you have the right to a citizen. You know, just like mm -hmm. you know, President Obama had to prove he was yeah, born in Hawaii. But he, over there, just like Japan and in Korea, just because you're born there doesn't mean that you get the right to a citizen. The same is true in Burma. The way the citizenship is, is through ancestry. If, you, if your parents were Burmese citizens, then you could. And you have to prove that. And it used to be, you know, culturally, uh, and I thought it was just culture, we had to know our genealogy. If I met you, I would say, I am Demian Thane, the daughter of so-and-so and so-and-so, the sister of, and we would say what our genealogy was. And it is not just cultural. There was a legal reason for it, because we are proving we are Burmese citizens. I didn't know that till you know, very recently. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, these people will have to show that they are born of uh, Myanmar citizens, Burmese citizens. But have the Rohingyas not been there for 200 years, a couple hundred years? Yeah. yeah. And if, if that's not the case, then they are not citizens. They came from Bangladesh. Is there a reason they are referred to as Bengalis rather than Burmese? Well, they, because people believe that they are illegal immigrants come from Bangladesh. That's why they're Bengalis. The word Rohingya does not exist. Actually, Derek um, Tonkin, who is a former British ambassador, has gone through massive research, and he said he went into the digital library of India and found no reference to Rohingya. Rohingya is a word that was used 
by the in the in Bengali uh, country and language as somebody the Muslim from Arakan. That's what it refers to. There is no ethnic group. It is more of a identity group. There is no ethnic group that's called Rohingya. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Now, tracing back to the 60s when the Burmese military implemented the forecast strategy, basically they cut off the food, the funds, the intelligence, and recruits, and that seems to have carried on into modern day. Uh, what can uh, State Councillor Suji do more to, you know, allow access of these um, basic essentials into the community, into the Rakhine State? Into the Rakhine State. I think they have a, a worked out a plan. It is a five-step plan the details of which I don't know, but I know that the international community has access to it, and each of them will be following it step by step. First is to have uh, peace and stability in the area. Everybody is protected. It's not just the what we call the Rohingyas, but also the native population of the Arakanis, the Hindus, all of those who live there, they also have peace and not be threatened by the other groups. So we need to have peace in the whole area. And, you know, she sticks to her rule um, and her, her moral compass of the rule of law. And she repeats that. If the law is this, everybody should be following the law. Nobody should be, you know, beating somebody up or mm -hmm. uh, killing somebody or whatever. Everybody should have uh, the protection of the law. And from there, then she wants economic development. And what we have is at fault, the NGO, especially the international NGOs, they want to help the poorest of the poor and the ones who are the most victimized. And of course, that goes into the quote unquote uh, Rohingya population. And there's resentment from the native uh, groups the Arakanis and the Hindus, mm -hmm. because they don't get the support that they they think that these NGOs should be giving them. I see. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mia. We've come to the end of the show. Um, I hope to, uh, you've learned as much as I do regarding the other side of the story, so that the next time that we want to engage in a knee-jerk moral reaction to con State Councillor Soon Ji, we will think back to the historical narrative. Thank you for being with us on the show today, Dr. Mia. Thank you Most for watching. Welcome. Thank you.